Okay, welcome. Thank you all very much for coming today. Um, we are going to do Setting a Pace for Success with Dr. Erica Martinez from the University of South Florida. She is an instructor in the Department of Economics there. Uh, she has her bachelor's from the University of Florida and a master's and PhD from Duke University. Um, she conducts research on various educational issues from school accountability to standards to early childhood development. And she's awesome. That little part's not in her bio, but it should be. Um, so we are using GoToWebinar software for this. So you should see a little orange button in the upper right hand corner. You can actually, if it's pointed to the right, you can make your the little uh, space seem smaller. If you point it to the left, you can pull all of that stuff out. Everybody is muted. But if you want to, you can, if you have questions, you can put them in the questions field and we will be answering them. <clears throat> if you have some basic questions that appear during the session, I'm on, oh, I should introduce myself. Um, my name is Becky Anderson and I work at McMillan. Um, so myself and two of my colleagues, Leslie, oh, three, Leslie and Alana and Madeline, we will help answer some questions. If you have questions for Dr. Martinez, we will save those for the end, but definitely type those in. Um, and if your screen is not showing the webinar, this little icon down here is actually the go to webinar icon. So you can click on that and you should get back to this view. All right, I'm going to stop and make you the presenter, Erica. Okay. And we can see your slides. Perfect. So hello and welcome. I want to start by thanking you for joining me today as I share with you some things that I incorporate in my class to improve student learning and success. There are several things that I build into the course, but the focus of this talk is going to be how I intentionally set up my course and, and lay out a lesson plan for the week so that I can set a pace for students that will help promote long-term learning. Research has shown there are four power tools for long-term learning, spacing, retrieval practice, interleaving, and feedback-driven metacognition. Space practice boosts learning by spreading lessons and retrieval opportunities out over time, so learning is not crammed all at once. Retrieval practice boosts learning by pulling information out of students' heads rather than cramming information into students' heads. Interleaving boosts learning by linking closely related topics and at times encouraging discrimination between similarities and differences across these topics. Feedback and metacognition improves learning by providing the opportunity for students to know what they know and know what they don't know. There's extensive literature that shows these four tools and how they improve long-term learning and ultimately drive student success. I won't go through these one by one, but I'll leave them here for you to reference later, as well as com a complete list of references at the end of the slide deck. The big takeaway is that time and time again, these four tools have shown to increase outcomes on test scores and ultimately student comprehension. And we hope that comprehension continues beyond our one semester courses. For this talk, the specific tool that I'm gonna focus on is spacing. However, these tools work best when used hand in hand and through spacing, I'll also incorporate each of these other tools. So what is space practice? Space practice involves taking a given amount of time devoted to learning and arranging that time into multiple sessions that are spread over time. In this way, the learning sessions are said to be spaced apart in time. This can be compared to the more popular approach known as cramming, in which we all know students do all or most of their studying in one long session shortly before a quiz or exam. While this is perhaps the most preferred way students learn, it's not the most effective, and we can use space practice to steer them away from relying on this type of study. Why does spacing work? When students have to retrieve things from memory and think deeply about what they're learning, they're more likely to remember the information over long term. When using space practice, retrieving the information across sessions will not always be easy and students will have to try to remember it. 
This can lead students to feel like they're not learning very well from space practice, but it's precisely why spacing works. The challenge from spacing dramatically improves long-term learning. So how can we implement space practice? We can break lessons into smaller sessions, revisit concepts that have been taught in previous class meetings, harness technology to help students get a space study schedule, and we can include cumulative retrieval practice. I want to share with you some specific ways I implement spacing in my course. I incorporate space practice mostly in my principal's classes. There are a couple reasons why I find that it's most useful to implement space practice at the introductory level. For one, I tend to have freshmen and sophomores in these courses. These students are new to college and fresh to the college experience and don't necessarily have complete skill set of how to study. So by setting up space practice for them, I can provide them with the blueprint. Secondly, the vast majority of students in my principal's courses are non-majors. And unfortunately, I found that non-majors are far less likely to devote adequate time to studying outside of the class and far more likely to when they do devote time, cram it in right before a quiz or exam. When with spacing, remember the goal is really to get students to spread out their study over time. When preparing my course, I generally think about the course at the week level with things, some things I consider in a given week, how much time do I want students to spend on the material? In a given week, how many different days do I want students to be working on the material? And then also how many different ways do I want students to be interacting with the material? Everything that I'm about to show you is student facing. This is exactly what students see when, I, when they navigate through my course and the expectations that I set for them. I teach this course face-to-face -face as a hybrid with about 50% of the material online and 50% in person, and then also fully online asynchronously. Most of what I'll talk about is from my hybrid course, but almost everything looks exactly the same across the three modalities, with just slight differences, especially for the online asynchronous session. My course is designed to be completed as a series of modules Everything that I want students to access, they can reach through the modules. I've broken the course up into 12 lectures. We complete four lectures, then there's an exam week, another four lectures, a second exam, another four lectures followed by the final exam. There's a module that corresponds to each lecture week. And within the module, there's a set of pre-assignments, lecture assignments, uh, practice lecture assignments, and then post-lecture assignments. And these assignments are spaced out across the week. In the very beginning of the semester, I take time to create a video that makes it clear of how the course is set up and why the course is set up in this way. And I focus on the fact that I really want them to space their learning over time so they can improve outcomes. Students have a clear idea of exactly what they should be completing on Mondays, which is the reading and a low stakes homework assignment. Tuesdays and Wednesdays, students should be watching the pre-recorded lectures and completing lecture notes. Wednesdays and Thursdays, they should be working on material that reinforce what they've learned in the lecture. On Thursdays, they come to class, we have discussion, or if it's online, they participate in the discussion board with one another. And if it's an exam week, then we have class on Tuesday to review. And lastly, a regular week students will complete the lecture level assessment quiz on a Friday. This is a glimpse of the calendar that I provide to students each week. There's a lecture students complete the exact same types of assignments for that lecture. So you can see each day, Monday through Friday, I want students to be interacting with the material as they progress throughout the week. All of my assignments are open at least a week in advance, so students do have the ability to cram if they wanted to. However, they'd have to do it at the front end of the week, and it's my experience that doesn't happen often. But I do like to give the students the option of completing assignments in advance if they need to or choose to do so. When I started teaching before I began intentionally setting up the course using space practice, this is essentially what I expected students or would like students to do anyway. I wanted them to read, take notes when they came to lecture, discuss in the class, and then I would assess them at the end of the, the week. And now, instead of leaving students on their own to complete these things, I have graded assignments set up to incentivize them to space out their learning. These are the pre-lecture assignments that are due on Mondays in a regular lecture week in my course. Students are asked to begin by watching a short introductory video that was made by the author of the textbook. 
Then students move on to reading the textbook. And finally, students complete a homework assignment based on the reading. It's important that the particular homework assignment is low stakes because the students have not received my lecture yet. And so I want to encourage and reinforce the reading with this assignment. The idea should be that students can answer the homework questions if they've read and had a very basic understanding of the related chapter. The assignment that I use to do this is Achieves Learning Curve. Learning Curve was developed specifically with the intent to encourage students to read the textbook. We all have, we all know that when we ask students to read, a lot of times they don't. And so having an assignment like this is vital to help ensure that reading of the textbook actually takes place. In Achieves Learning Curve, the instructor sets a target score and students continuously answer questions at any time before the deadline until they reach that target score. Students either receive a grade of zero if they haven't reached the score or 100%. So essentially any student that does this reading assignment and works on the assessment, the, uh, the learning curve assignment is going to earn 100%. For this reason, learning curve is not an assessment tool. It's a tool that we can use to incentivize reading of the book and have students do retrieval practice. But that's okay because at this point of the week, I don't want students to uh, be assessed on whether or not they understand the material, I want to encourage them to begin getting their feet wet, so to speak. So when they're answering the questions in Learning Curve each week, there's a link to where in the textbook that question is represented and exactly how students can access that information. The students also can elect to receive a hint or they can skip the question and move on so that they can just answer more questions to reach the target score. So hopefully students will come to understand if they complete the reading first, they're more likely to finish the learning curve faster. And if they don't, that's fine because learning curve will still reinforce reading of the textbook while, while you're doing the assignment. Students then move on to watch the lecture. Each lecture is broken down to some subtopics and the videos are between five to 12 minutes based on each of those subtopics. In my hybrid course and the online asynchronous class, I have a series of recorded lecture videos and the entire lecture, traditional lecture, takes place through these recordings. In a traditional face-to-face -face class, I would give the lecture on say a Tuesday and whatever part of the lecture I don't finish, students are then assigned to watch the remaining videos and submit lecture notes on Wednesday. The students are given a lecture outline or shell as they watch the lecture. They're required to take notes as I illustrate and discuss the concepts. What's important is that I have students upload their lecture notes every week. The lecture notes are scored just for completion, not correctness. I don't spend too much time grading them. Mostly I just skim them so I can see roughly what percentage they've completed and I assign a grade accordingly. The main objective of having students submit notes is to incentivize them just enough to make sure that they're staying on pace with how I want them to complete the materials for the course. I found that even a low percentage attached to these lecture notes provides enough incentive to get the vast majority of students to complete these assignments. I wanna show you just a few seconds of the recording so you can see how it looks. You'll notice a couple things. One, these are not static voiceover PowerPoints. And two, my picture, my image appears so students can see both the notes and my, my face just as they would in a live lecture. Both of these help create a more engaging lecture for students. And this is particularly important in a course that is entirely asynchronous where this is the only face-to-face -face interaction I will have with most of my students. So we'll watch just a little bit of this. Now we work on an example of comes along and says, oh, there's a price ceiling, imposing a price ceiling, and it happens to be above the equilibrium. In this case, nothing happens. In terms of abiding by the restriction, the price point is already below this, so the firms and the consumers don't have to change anything. This is, again, a non-binding constraint. So the constraint still exists, but it's not binding in this particular market or at least this range of apartment prices. The price ceiling goes into effect and the government places the price ceiling below the existing price point, then two things are going to happen. On the supply side, we have a decrease in the quantity supplied in the market. So the new quantity. So you get the idea. Then I give students some additional materials to help them prep for the class discussion. 
In these additional materials, I use podcasts, news articles, and videos that reflect the concepts that we've learned in the course and what's happening in the real world. This is also a great opportunity for interleaving. A lot of these examples will link concepts from across multiple lectures. The idea is that students will work on this before they come to class and be better prepared to answer questions during the class session. And that's true whether or not the class takes place remotely or in person. If I have a class that's online and completely asynchronous, I still do this. I just have a, an optional discuss with Dr. Martinez op, office hour where students can drop in and I can have a traditional office hour, but I'll often use these examples to go over concepts that they would like to review. Then when students come to class, I begin each class with an iClicker quiz. I use iClicker because it allows me to easily score these quizzes and have the grade integrated in my gradebook. All the questions could be answered if they only watch the lecture videos. So doing the discussion prep is not necessary to do well in these assignments. However, if they've also completed the discussion prep, many of the questions are pulled from those concepts that are revisited. And students are allowed to access their notes while they take this quiz, but they can't work with one another. This usually takes about 10 to 15 minutes at the start of class. And then I begin the class discussion using the quiz to review the concept and elaborating on that concept that I present in the quiz. And this is a very dynamic discussion I hold with students going back and forth and pushing them to use retrieval practice. During the classroom discussion review, I also rely on other things like experiments, activities in class, other videos that I incorporate into the discussion, whatever else I can get students engaged and relate them to the concept. We can listen to just a little bit here. So the first one of violence, right here, what's the definition of break feelings? Yes, it's a government imposed highest price. We can be sold for. How does the price ceiling have to look at that? So every time throughout the lecture, I'm going back and forth with students, asking them questions to revisit information that they already learned in the lecture and providing them feedback on their concepts, on their responses, and getting them to engage with one another and correcting each other's responses as well. I typically end the class with what I think is one of the best parts of the lecture. I give students a multiple choice question that students tend to get wrong or in otherwise because they don't understand the concepts very well or it's otherwise very challenging. And sometimes, but not always, this question requires students draw from multiple concepts that they've learned throughout the course. This exercise is similar to a think-pair-share. Here, I ask students to use clickers individually and in silence to answer the first question. They can use their personal notes, but they're not allowed to access the internet or discuss with one another. Then I myself re review the poll results, but I don't I don't post them for students to see. Then students have the opportunity to discuss the question as a group. Usually I have them work in groups of three to four. After a period of discussion, students again answer the same question using iClicker. And finally, we discuss the question as a class. And this takes place in a very engaging conversation where groups take turns as I lead them to first discuss each answer choice that's incorrect and specifically focus on why they're wrong. And then we end on the correct answer and discuss why that answer is correct. And the key is that they're focusing on using the economic models and concepts that they've learned so far to demonstrate how they arrived at their answers. And through this process, I'm engaging students by providing them feedback and forcing them to think not only think about the question, but think about how they answer the question and how they've used the concepts they've learned in the course to support that answer. After class, students then return to Canvas where there are a set of practice and study materials that I've prepared for them. These include some worksheets with the solutions available and already posted, as well as practice assignment that I've set up and achieved. The practice assignment is what you would typically see on a homework assignment that would be at the end of the week or after a lecture. None of these assignments are factored into the student's grade. They're there entirely for students to use as practice, but I found that it's important to place it in the module so that students can see what's expected of them in terms of how they should be studying each week. And also I set a due date in Achieve 
And I found that something as simple as setting a due date for a practice assignment dramatically increases the number of students who are working on this assignment. And finally, at the end of the week, students are asked to complete a quiz. And this quiz is at the unit level as an assessment. And the quiz is closed book, closed notes, and proctored online. There's also a set of cumulative assignments that take place throughout the course. I have two within semester exams and a final exam. The final is cumulative and all exams are closed book, closed notes, and they take place in class or are proctored online. And students also have two main writing assignments. In these writing assignments, students are asked or tasked with applying the concepts they've learned in class to analyze a real world issue. Some topics that I write or have them write about are the limited availability of parking on campus, how society allocates organs for transplant, climate change, and overfishing in the fishing industry. They have one writing assignment that's a short essay and one term paper with a rough draft component. After both the short essay and the rough draft, students receive feedback on their submission. So students have opportunities for deep reflection through feedback-driven metacognition, again, supporting long-term learning and understanding. This is what a typical week looks like in my class when we have a cumulative assignment that's due. No new material is presented in that week. I give a review at the front end of the week that's also streamed online if I have asynchronous session, and students then complete the writing assignments on Wednesday, and then on Thursday, Friday, they have the opportunity to complete the exam. And that's it. The process continues into the next set of lectures, followed by another exam, and so on. This is the approach that I use, whether I, I'm teaching in a completely face-to-face -face course, a hybrid course, or online. It's also the same approach I would use if I'm teaching when I teach at a four-year university or at a, a two-year community college. The only distinction would be at a two-year college. I don't include the writing assignment unless it's an honors course. There are some potential challenges you might face when implementing space practice. First off, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, through space, space practice can feel slow and ineffective. But students complete these multiple assignments through spacing and it helps reinforce the concepts and also highlights where they need to study more so they can make their study time more effective. It's the challenge created in space practice that actually improves learning and understanding. Secondly, using space practice can require an organized schedule. And depending on how much organization you're used to incorporating your course, you might be hesitant to start implementing space practice. I found that there's certainly a high fixed cost to creating a very organized schedule, but the marginal cost can often be quite low from semester to semester. And lastly, students may not use space practice on their own. But it's precisely why it becomes more important to develop a space schedule for them, particularly for younger students who are newer to college and those who may be less interested in the material. To conclude, I just wanna highlight a few important things. One, the more spacing, the better for long-term learning, durable learning. Teachers and students should strive to revisit information over space time intervals as many times as possible. The exact number of spacing sessions that can be incorporated and the time intervals between might depend on the course and information being learned. The most effective way to learn is to use retrieval practice. Students keep it keeps students engaged by finding different types of assignments they can complete while using retrieval practice. And spacing still benefits learning even when students acquire the information purely through reading or listening to a lecture, but spacing is even more effective when students learn by using retrieval practice. I'll leave you with a set of references if you'd like to explore some of these materials further and whether or not you're already incorporating space learning I hope you leave this talk with some ideas of how you can incorporate these power tools into your class and improve the success of your students. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we, um, if you have questions, put them in the questions panel. We do have a number of questions. Um, do you explicitly talk to your students about spacing when you do this? I do. At the start of the of the semester, I usually have like a welcome video and I have my canvas all ready 
usually I try to do two weeks in advance. Canvas is already set up, the syllabus set up, everything. And I send a welcome announcement and there's a welcome video that goes out and it explains how to navigate through the course as well as why the course is set up in this way. And do you find that this technique works in upper level courses or how does it look different in those types of courses? So in particular, when I teach, uh, let's say advanced uh, micro theory class, I, I don't have the assignments set up as much as I have them in principles. I sort of leave it for them. I let them know you should be studying. Um, so for instance, I have a hybrid advanced micro theory course that I teach and we have the recorded lectures, which I tell them they need to watch by Tuesday. I send out a recitation. They don't need to submit notes, so I don't have them submit their notes. I, I have a recitation file that I say, hey, we're gonna cover this on Thursday. You should try to work on these questions before Thursday to get, out of, um, get the most out of the Thursday class, but I don't have them submit it. I have practice assignments posted for them, but I don't have them submitted. And I, I do have a quiz after right before class so that's to incentivize them to watch the recording like there's a short quiz that they have to take and then on the back end of class they have a homework so i do incorporate a lot of these things but i leave it more for them to make sure that they are are meeting these markers i don't have as many due dates set up in a week but i do have as many assignments set up they're just on their own to do that um, this is a great question. How did you get started with this? Your work is amazing and it feels overwhelming to start my own courses. But the actual question is, how did you get started with this? How did I get started with this? It's a process, right? I've been teaching principles uh, for at my current university for 11 years, but even before that, I was teaching it three years before that. So almost 15 years. And every semester, I'm just constantly, oh, let me tweak this, let me tweak that. And it's it's looked pretty much like this for the past five years, but I didn't have all the due dates attached to everything. And it's only the last two years, it's definitely before COVID where I started making them submit the lecture notes that right right before, so that was about two years ago, where I was like, maybe I need to have them submit these notes because they're not watching them. And that's when I really started assigning due dates to them. And do you lecture on Thursdays as well with your in-person? Yes, the Thursday in-person, this is what I do on a Thursday in person is this type of lecture that I showed. So they've, I don't do, I don't introduce the material. I wouldn't go as slow as I do in the recording because they've already, I've already defined price floor for them. I've already introduced them slowly to the concept. So here I really rely on, I just guide their discussion mostly. I, I ask them leading questions almost the entire period so that we can review the material. And how many students do you have in your class periods? In, in my online class, that's asynchronous, there's anywhere from three to 400 students. In my synchronous classes, there's anywhere from 40 to 60 in my in-person classes, usually. Wow, I, I mean, this, I- This class has 45 in it. Um, and I usually, I used to be better at learning their names. If I have less than 30, I know everybody's name who comes to class regularly. I have to admit, I'm I'm not as it, when I started ten years ago. If I had less than eighty, I would learn everybody's name that came regularly. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed. I, I was actually wondering myself about this with regard to the writing assignments, but wow, three to four hundred students and you're well, doing writing. For the writing assignments, I have great. We have graders. I don't. I don't. I do regrading if students want, and I do office hours for feedback, but I don't grade the writing assignments. I can't. It's there's not enough man hours. Okay. All right. Good. I'm glad you're still sleeping. That's the important. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, I think actually sort of what you do sort of answers this, but the question is, how do you main, maintain attendance for students? I don't give an attendance grade. I give iClicker, those iClicker quizzes, and through that, they are scored in part for participation. So they, depending on the question, I give anywhere from 50 to 60 percent of their score just for participating during that question and then i'll i'll give the rest for correctness and that incentivizes them for being there but they don't get points just for being present but you could use iClicker to take attendance as well 
I like it because then I don't have to, I can just go and have it synced to my grade book. So it's not really an extra step that I need to do. I would also imagine, frankly, I mean, it, the, the lecture notes are sort of a requirement for attendance also, right? If, you, if, you, if you're supposed to be doing the lecture notes and you didn't go to lecture, that sort of, that is a problem for you as a student. So yeah. All right. Um, does anyone have any last questions? I think this is I think this has been great. Um, and as someone who's not a procrastinator, I love this system. My husband, who's a procrastinator, would hate it, but we won't talk about him. <laughs> um, okay. Does iClicker work for a hybrid class with students, uh, with some students face to face and some students logging in from Zoom? Mm -hmm. um it works yes i haven't done it i've used it where all the students are online and i've used it where all the students are face to face but i haven't used it both ways um but it's possible you can use it yeah students don't have to be in the phys in the same classroom to use it excellent all right i think that might be our last question so thank you, Dr. Martinez, very much for doing this. Um, this has been great. And um, to everyone who is on the call, we will send out the recording afterwards. Um, and if you have colleagues who you think uh, might be interested in this, you can absolutely send the recording information to them also. Um, just give us a couple days to get it out there. It probably won't be, let's say, at 2.45 today. Um, it might be Friday. Um, and we'll get this information out there. Um, so that hopefully you can try some new things. And I think, you know, what, um, what Dr. Martinez said is correct. You don't have to start, you know, don't start big. You can start small and do some of these little things and incorporate them piecemeal. And then over several semesters, you've sort of developed more of a system and your head hasn't exploded. So Yes. Yes. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, we will talk to everyone later. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.